Is your faith working for you? Does it really make a difference to your life, honestly, when you think about it from day to day? That's interesting. I come across uh, people as a pastor who have found in their lives that the, the faith of their childhood is just not working for them anymore. You know, they, they grew up going to church, went to worship each Sunday, just about, went to Sunday school, memorized scripture, but they have found as they have gotten older that, well, that faith just doesn't work for them. As John Wesley would say, they have the form of religion without its power. Sometimes it's college students who have more questions than answers. Uh, sometimes it's, it's people who go through a, a great crisis in their lives and their faith just, just help, doesn't help them cope at all. And sometimes it's people who grew up in legalistic or fundamentalist households and for them, growing up, religion was just rule following and as an adult, they just wanna get as far away as possible from the church. Now you may find this surprising, but I enjoy meeting people like that and talking with them and discussing religion with them. And one of the reasons why I enjoy talking with people like that is quite often they are liberated by a conversation with me. They feel validated because they discover that I have the same hangups about religion that they do. Religion as rule following. Christians who claim that you have to check your brain at the door when you come into worship. Christians who claim that doubting and questioning is just a, an awful thing. I'm like, excuse me? And so many of them come out of those conversations feeling liberated and discovering a new kind of faith that they thought they could never have. And not only that, they discover a faith that works for them, that transforms them, that changes them. And they, they say things like, I never knew I, faith could be this way. I never knew that faith could work this way. I, I never knew I could, could see faith this way. Do you have the same kind of excitement about your faith? Does it invigorate you? Does it inspire you? Does it change you? Does it help you every single day? Does it empower you? If so, wonderful. Go ahead and work on your grocery list for today, okay? But if not, I'm gonna tell you why. Why it's not working for you. And more importantly, I'm gonna show you this morning how to find a faith that's gonna empower you in your life. You see, it's been my experience that, that many people who go through a crisis of faith or folks that their faith just doesn't work for them anymore either have never learned or they have forgotten the single most important thing about the Christian faith. And this idea is communicated in the Bible to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation of all places. The church at Ephesus was a faithful church, it seemed, they were in the midst of persecution by the Roman government. They were trying to stay faithful. They were trying to stay strong. They were trying to do the right things. But God saw beyond that. He saw beyond their orthodoxy, beyond their religiosity, beyond their morality, and knew they had forgotten what was most important. And so the Lord inspired John to write this letter to the church at Ephesus to get them back to where it all began. Listen to these words carefully because they reveal the heart of God. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. In other words, God was saying, I see your good works but I'm disappointed because you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten your love for me. You've forgotten your relationship with me. You've forgotten that I'm the one that empowers you to do all the things that you do in your life. And I know that many of us in the sanctuary today need to insert our names into this passage and hear God say to us, I see that you come to church and that's great and I, I see you do good deeds and that's great and I see you do all these nice things and that's great, but you've forgotten your relationship with me. I, I've noticed that you don't have power in your life, you don't have guidance in your life and the reason for that is if you've forgotten your relationship with me. You see folks, the single most important thing we need to remember about our faith is this, that your faith and our faith is not a religion, it's a relationship. And if you forget that, let me tell you folks, your faith is never gonna work for you. 
It's never gonna make a difference to you. It's never gonna empower you. Because I tell you folks, religion is about following rules. Christianity is about following the person of Jesus Christ. Religion is trying to reach for God. Christianity is God reaching for us. I've said before that Christianity is unique in this way. In every other religion, people are desperately trying to find God. But in the Christian faith, a faith unlike any other, God reaches down to find us. And he shows us that his love for us is relentless, that he will go all the way to the cross to find us, to be in relationship with us. So God says, what pleases me is when you let me near you. What pleases me is when you let me walk with you. What pleases me is when you let my love surround you and you're in relationship with me. You see, a relationship with God and Jesus Christ is where everything begins and everything flows out of that. You know, Wayne Cadero is a, is a pastor in Hawaii and he talks about the time he went to the preschool concert, you know, at the church. And it was Christmas time. And so he, he got to the, you know, the sanctuary or wherever similar to this, and he got there, and of course, every parent uh, and every family member was there. The place was packed, and every single one of them was fully equipped with their smartphones with the brightest flash known to humankind, right? So he gets there, and he notices the, the kids line up on the stage, you know, and they're just three years old. You know, they can't speak in complete sentences, let alone sing, but they're up there, Right? And, and the girls are on the front part of the risers and the boys are in the back and the boys have capes and the girls have glitter in their hair and they look great and they look cute. And of course, one willing-hearted teacher, there's always one, right, God bless them, shows up, walks on the stage and tries to get them to, you know, come together and not come, and the kids don't care. Oh, there's mommy, hey, hey daddy, there's mommy, right? And then soon... The song is ready to begin, and the teacher begins, joy to the world, and she goes, a one, a two, joy to, and she's the only one singing, right? Hi, mommy, hi, daddy. And every parent takes a picture, and it looks like Haley's comment went straight through the room, you know? It's so bright. And of course, they're doing that, and they're singing, and, and Gadero says that, that one boy in the back fell over and took four boys with them. Bang! And they kept on singing, joy to the world. It was formless and void, absolute chaos. And get this, when they were finished, there was a standing ovation. They all stood up and clapped. Oh, isn't that great? Well, after the concert, Gadero went to a side room for some punch and cookies and all that. And he thought to himself, that has got to be the worst concert I've ever been to in my life. They just gave a standing ovation to the worst concert ever. They just took pictures of the worst concert ever. And then he saw it. He saw a little girl run to her father and her father said, oh, I'm so proud of you. You did so good. And they hugged. And Kadera said, at that moment I realized but it wasn't about the performance. Her, her father didn't clap because of the performance. Her father clapped because that was, that was his child up there. That was his child. You know, and, and I think about this, you know, having Paul. He's almost a year old. I can't believe it. Can you believe that? He's almost a year. And a deeper understanding of faith in God has come to me by having this child. You know, I was ready to applaud when he was born, you know? He didn't do anything. And, and I realized, you know, I, I applaud him and I love him not because of his performance or anything he does. Most of what he does is just silly and weird and all that. I do because that's my child. I love him because he is. He is. He's mine. And, and, and I get back to that, and I see that the same thing is true of God. 
God doesn't applaud me or applaud you because of our performance. He applauds us because we are his children and he loves us and we have a relationship with him. And that relationship is amazing and it empowers us and that love surrounds us and it makes a difference to us. You see, we all need to get back to our first love, that relationship. Because, you know, many people in the church have what I like to call a secondhand faith in Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of people will put this patchwork picture of Jesus together based upon what their grandmother said about Jesus or the church or what they read in a book or what they see in a movie and all that. And they try to put this together in the secondhand faith. And, and through all that, Jesus is saying, I don't want you to know about me. I want you to know me. So this morning, if you, if you lack the power, it may be because you're forgetting the person of Jesus Christ and his relationship with you. And let me tell you this, folks. When you tune yourself in to that relationship with God and Jesus Christ and feel that power and sense that guidance, amazing things can happen to your life. And for the next few minutes, I wanna share with you what some of those amazing things are. When you realize that relationship with Jesus Christ is where it begins and where it ends and where the journey is, you'll discover the power to change. The power to change is predicated on relationships and our relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God is changing us from glory to glory, not from gory to gory, but from glory to glory. And it's God who does the changing, not us. It's God who does the molding. On our own, we could never change. On our own, we could never transform. But by God's power, we can. It's because of that relationship. Now, when I met Brandy, I, I discovered that she had different musical tastes than me. You know, and, uh, and so, I mean, we've learned over the years to try to like one another's taste in music. But, you know, I like hard rock and blues and all that. And she likes that okay. But when I, I first met her, she was really into boy bands, you know? And when I met her, NSYNC was really popular, you know? Remember NSYNC? Lauren, I think you used to open up for them, didn't you, or something like that? You know, NSYNC was big, right? And so we had been dating, you know, for a while, and it was around Christmas time, and I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I decided, you know, what am I gonna get her for Christmas? I know, I'll buy her tickets to NSYNC. I hadn't really thought through that. <laughs> and so, you know, I presented her the tickets on Christmas, and she's like, really? You're going to go to the NSYNC concert with me? Yeah, I, I guess I am. <laughs> and the concert, I'll never forget, was at Tampa Stadium, right? Tampa Bay Stadium. And it was pouring down rain. And, of course, Charlie Sprung really good for the great tickets on the ground, no cover. And it was pouring down rain. Not only that, I was the oldest person there <laughs> at 25, right? <laughs> I mean, you can imagine, right? Preteens and teenagers. I mean, I'm like, I felt like an old man. And, and it started, it kept raining, it kept raining. And, and honestly, I was praying, don't tell Brandy this, I was praying that they would just cancel the concert at that moment, right? Well, eventually the rain stopped and the concert began and she came on stage and you would not believe the screams. I was deaf for a week. I was like, oh my gosh. But then I looked over at Brandy and I'd never seen her so happy. Oh my God, you know? She's crying, oh my gosh. And she was having such a great time. And as I'm looking at her, I'm like, you know what? Well, I might as well join in. <laughs> and at the risk of being beat up by my closest friends, I started to have a good time too. Like, this is pretty good. The music's not bad. This is fun. But here's the truth. I would have never bought those tickets. I would have never had a great time at that concert if it wasn't for my love for Brandy and my relationship with her. My love for her is what caused me to change. Change is predicated on relationship. 
And so often I forget this in my relationship with God. And I say to God, God, this change you want to make in my life, it's too difficult. The, this, the, the sin you want me to walk away from, it's just too difficult. This way you want me to go down this road, it, it's just too difficult. And then I hear the Lord say to me, Charlie, just come closer to me. Closer to my love. Closer to my heart. And you'll find the power to change. I mean, this is what John 5, 3 says. Take a look. This is an interesting statement. And this is the love of God. Take a look. That you keep his commandments and his commandments are not what? Not burdensome. Why are they not burdensome? Because of our love relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, love has what we like to call a creative affinity, which means the more you love something, the more you become like that something. Have you ever seen those older couples those you know, older couples, that they look just like one another. Ever seen that? They walk the same. They talk the same. They even look the same. It's like they morph. Ever seen that? Why is that? Because of their love for one another. And it's the same way with our relationship with God. The more we love God and feel that love, the more we embody that love. So how are you doing with changes in your life that you need to make? Do you find them hard? Just come closer to the embrace of our Lord, and he'll give you the power to change. But you know what? A relationship with Christ not only gives us the power to change, believe it or not, it also gives us the power to forgive. Now, forgiving is not easy to do, amen? It's not. It's not easy for me, it's not easy for you, but here's what I've discovered as I've grown in my relationship with God. That the more I think about how Christ has forgiven me, the more I think about how patient Christ has been with me, the more I think of the times where God has not abandoned me, when he could have despised me and left me, the more I think about that love that he's given me when I have not deserved it the easier it is for me to forgive. First John says this, we love, why? Because he first loved us. In Luke 7, when Jesus is addressing the, the woman who anointed his feet with oil and Jesus forgave her, basically that message was, he has, who has been forgiven much forgives a great deal. There are two colleagues of mine by the name of Ken and Joel who went to Candler School of Theology, the same seminary I went to at Emory University in Atlanta. And they were in what we had called an ass a ministry assessment group. It was called supervised ministry. We called it, behind the professor's back, supervised misery. But anyway. But Ken and Joel, they, they were in this same group, and they would get together and they would discuss, they would analyze their ministry and their ways of doing ministry and all that, and they developed a, a real bond, a real friendship. They had a lot in common. Joel played football for Dartmouth College, big, burly guy, and they both loved to jog. And so they would often jog around this, you know, th this body of water in this park just about every day. They would jog, and, and one day they were jogging, and they were looking at a, a father and a child fishing together. And Joe was smiling. And Ken asked Joel, what are you smiling at? He says, you notice that girl is imitating everything her father does. When, when, when he would cast, she would cast. When, when he would, you know, move his hat a little, she would move her hat a little. When he sat down, she would sit down. And Ken said, you know what? Seeing a, a child imitate her father makes my heart smile. Well, the next day, Joel wasn't smiling because in his supervised misery ministry group, there was a guy that basically became his enemy. He just couldn't stand him. I mean, everything he said, the guy would be against he would cut him off, he would insult him, he would be demeaning to him and rude to him. I mean, they just didn't like each other until one day things reached a boiling point and awful things were said. 
And Joel said, oh my gosh, they feel like running over this guy like it did on the football field. Well, time passed, and there was a couple days before the next meeting for supervised ministry. And they were jogging around the park again. And Joel asked, Ken asked, Joel, have you decided what you're going to do about this guy, how you're going to deal with him? He said, yeah. Joel said, I think I'm going to forgive him. Ken said, what? I'm going to forgive him. And Ken started to smile. And Joel said, well, why are you smiling? And Ken said, seeing a child imitate his father always makes my heart smile. When we imitate our Lord Christ, it always makes him smile. When we get back to our relationship with God and Jesus Christ, we are given the power to change, the power to forgive, but I think most of all, and this may mean a lot to many of you here today, it gives us the power over our fears. And I can't think uh, of a greater passage of scripture that communicates this Then one of my favorites, Romans 8. Just let this fall over you right now. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons Neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hear me. Our love relationship with God is always with us. It never leaves us. Not only that, it empowers us through good times and bad. That power is always there. That love is always there. And it will never separate from us. Not even death. Sue Monk Kidd is a great author. Ever heard of her? She wrote The Secret Life of Bees and other books. And she remembers when she was pregnant with her second child. And her three-year-old son named Bob, he was just terrified of the dark. I mean, he would wake up in the middle of the night terrified and cry, and she tried everything. She was desperate. Tried to leave the hall light on, tried to put a night light in his room. Nothing would work. He would still wake up and wake her up. Well, one night, he was crying, afraid of the dark, and Sue walked in and began to hug him, to comfort him. And as she did, Bob touched her tummy and began to rub it. And then he looked up at his mom and said, Mom, is it dark inside there where he lives? Said, yeah, it's, it's pretty dark. And then he asked, do you think he has a nightlight in there? No. Then he asked, Mommy, you think he's afraid being all by himself in there? And she said, sweetheart, no. Because you see, he's really not alone. He's inside me. I'm always with him. And then she looked at Bob and said, Bob, and it's the same with you. When you get afraid and scared and think you're all alone, you're really not. I carry you inside of me too. You're always in my heart. I carry you in my heart. And she looked at Bob to see if it registered, and she didn't know, but he fell back asleep. And that was the last time he ever woke up in the middle of the night. And then Sue began to think, you know, when I was a kid, I just thought God was just up there. And then I grew a little, and then I realized, well, God is is all around me, all around here. And then I discovered that 
that God is within me. And then she said, surprise of all surprise, then I have discovered that I am within God. I am in God's heart. And because of that, I don't have to be afraid. Get back to your first love. Get back to the heart of God. And you'll find the power to change. You'll find the power to forgive. And you'll find power over your fear. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, draw us back to you and your love and our relationship with you. Teach us to remember today that it's through you and your love that we gain the power we need for living, to make the changes that we need to make, to forgive others as you have forgiven us, and to overcome our fears in life that have such a hold on us. So Lord, as we pray to you, we we sink ourselves back into your love and we lay ourselves close to your heart and remember that you always carry us in your heart. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.